who works um, mainly in Niles at um, Fighting Gymnastics. We're at, um, or the new name, but the one in Northbrook that just changed this last year. And then we have one in Libertyville, and then um, we were working with IK in Chicago. But I've had kids from all the way out Hinsdale up to Schaumburg, Arlington Heights, all over. Um, that I've worked with, so I'm pretty familiar with most of the suburbs. Um, so I'll start with a little bit about Tiger. Um, students for therapy, yoga, gymnastics, rocks. Um, most of our sessions happen in gymnastics facilities. Um, that's where we do everything, and it basically mimics a typical gymnastics class, only rolling in all the therapy aspects into it. And then we also have, um, especially next to the Viking gymnastics, we have two smaller studios that we can do yoga with, or if the kids need table work, or we need to work on those more like typical therapy type things that we can do, or if they need a little quiet time before they go into the gym, or after, then we can use those. Um, what I really like about Tiger is we try to get into the community setting as much instead of just in a regular clinic, and we try really hard to meet the kids where they are, what the families are struggling with, what community goals the families might have, and just having a fun place where the kids can come and do therapy, and like Holly said, not feel like they're at therapy, but still working on all of the same goals. Um, I've been with them six years now, I think. Yeah, six years. I've been a therapist for um, nine years. Um, started yoga about five years ago with the kids, and it's just rolled into something that I really, really love doing with them. It's so much fun. I'm also a former gymnast, so getting to roll my passion of OT and yoga and gymnastics all into one and getting to do it every single day is just a dream come true for me. So happy to be here and share it with you today. Um, I know a lot of people get confused about all the different therapies, what they are and what do they work on and all of that. So um, OT and PT can be in a lot of different settings, hospitals, acute care, private clinics, schools, home base, community. Um, so I thought I would kind of just explain what our OT and PT is in the private sector, kind of how we go about um, focusing on kids. So the main thing that we really work on is um, sensory processing. I know you've probably heard that word a lot. Um, if you haven't, welcome. <laughs> it, um, it's kind of the overarching goal that goes everything that we're working with with therapy. So kind of explain it a little bit. Sensory processing is just how your brain takes in all of the information in your environment and processes it and then tells your body what to do. Um, so it incorporates all of the senses, everything that you're taking in visually, auditorily, tactile, everything you're touching, seeing, hearing, that is your sensory processing. Now all of us process things just a little bit differently. My voice may sound really loud to some of you, it may sound a little bit quieter to some of you. The lights might be a little bit too bright, they might be a little bit too dim, but every second we are processing all of that, our brain is telling us how we're processing it, and then we're carrying out all of our motor movement through that processing. Now, kids with ADD or ADHD or autism or Down syndrome, any kind of developmental delay, are processing that information just a little bit differently. They can be getting that information too fast, they can be getting it too slow, it can be too intense, it can be not intense enough, and then you also have the visual, auditory, tactile, all of that as well. So the visual could be too much, but the auditory could be not enough. The touch could be too much, but the visual could not be enough. So you have all of these spectrums mixed together of how they're processing not just one type of sensory, but all of them together. <clears throat> so, if you are processing things differently than all of your peers in an environment naturally, that's going to lead to a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of dysregulation, um, and then layered on top of that anxiety is a lot of these kids either don't have verbal communication to tell us how they're feeling and what they're processing, um, or they don't have the words to describe how they're feeling or what's going on with their body. Um, so with this anxiety leading to the dysregulation, that's where you kind of see a lot 
uh, if you've heard about the behaviors or if you see a child um, in your library or out in the community who looks like they're having a meltdown or something, that, that dysregulation is leading to the anxiety and leading to those behaviors. It's kind of what the goal of OT and PT is, is to help those children reach a level of self-regulation, internal body awareness, so that they can identify how they're feeling and reach a level of regulation and then learn from each of those experiences. So the more that they practice that self-regulation and the more they practice being in that state of dysregulation and moving through it, it's just like any other type of muscle memory. We're slowly teaching them how to identify how they're feeling and to stop it before that anxiety takes over. So with the gymnastics and yoga, it's just a fun way to work on the motor planning and strengthening and stretching and regulation and all that in a very fun environment so they feel like they're just taking a gymnastics class or they're just hanging out with their peers and they're learning all of these muscle movements without like the additional stress. It just kind of takes a layer of the anxiety off so we can get deeper into regulating the, the processing. Um, So a lot, um, a lot of these kids, if they do have the anxiety starts at an early age due to uh, the sensory processing, they may seek or avoid certain motor movements due to what type of sensory thing they prefer or what type they like to avoid. So in seeking or avoiding those certain motor movements, they may miss certain developmental milestones. <coughs> so another aspect of OT and PT is to guide them slowly through those milestones that they have missed so that we're retraining their brain to not really go into that fight or flight mode when they start that motor planning or they receive that sensory information so they can slowly meet those milestones and then meet their peers at an age appropriate level. Um, most of the kids that we work with when we start, you can think of them about a half age level of their peers. So if they're 10, they may be functioning at like a five or six year old level with motor movements or language or whatever. But that also, again, um, you have to take into account how severe or how mild the sensory processing is. So you could have a 16-year-old who's functioning at a 5-year-old level or 6-year-old or 10 or it just kind of is all over the spectrum. So kind of finding where they are on that, meeting them where they are, and then slowly moving them through all of that is really pause there for a second and see if you have any questions or if that was too technical or if that kind of, kind of makes sense. So, awesome. I know sensory processing can be really difficult. So, um, so that's basically what OT and PT are. Um, so with the yoga, it's a really great way to work on that regulation, the self-awareness, all of the motor planning all rolled into one, but it's just another fun way to do it. Um, I like to use the stories because it keeps the kids really engaged and in the present, so they're not thinking about the motor planning as much. They're not thinking about um, how does the mat feel or how does her voice sound or all of that. It's just another way to really get them engaged and release some of that anxiety. Um, how I usually build my stories, um, I start with kind of an overarching theme. Um, I work a lot with kids on the spectrum. They really like nature, they really like animals, so that's tend, what my stories tend to be focused around. Um, I'll pick maybe eight to ten poses to, for my flow. I have to go really, really slowly moving through those, so those eight to ten poses could last 30 to 40 minutes depending on the kids' attention. Um, the main thing that I like to focus on is, like Holly mentioned, the pace. So we might move a little bit fast and then we slow down. So it's kind of that, um, that dynamic of going between something active and static, active and static, because that also works on that self-regulation. A lot of these kids have impulsivity control. So if they're moving fast, they're always moving fast. If they're moving slow, they're always moving slow. So learning how to gauge 
that motor planning, moving fast and then moving slow helps with the internal regulation as well and just overall body control and body awareness. Um, so for example, we might, I might use some of the poses to transition to another pose, hold that pose for a little bit, maybe do like a little stretching or add a little fun movement with the story in that pose, um, then move to another one. Um, With the, uh, with the sensory processing, so I'm just always checking in. If I say I have my 10 set poses, doesn't mean I'm going to make it through all of those. I may only get through five of them, and I'm constantly having to read the kids and see where they are. If I have a group of kids that is very, very high energy, maybe I'm only going to use like three or four poses, and we are going to move them very, very sluggishly slow, or maybe I pick one pose and I do like five or six different things with that pose so that they don't get overwhelmed with the motor planning or anything, um, anything like that. Um, and then usually where my story ends is somewhere really quiet and calming once we move into Shavasana because um, they don't usually like to sit still. It's really hard for them to just stop and let their bodies be calm. So hopefully with all of the movement and the motor planning and the story, they can get to that point of relaxation and then I usually give them, usually it's not more than like five or six minutes because then they'll start getting restless and antsy and whatever I get. Um, cueing the breathing throughout the story is another big thing because a lot of these kids with the anxiety um, and the lack of body awareness, they're holding their breath a lot or it's like in short gas or it may be like a couple really deep breaths and then they start breathing really fast again. So as much as I can tie the breathing into all of the poses with the motor planning that helps them stay regulated and stay connected as well. Um, and what I found is after the story, they usually like to play with all of my yoga cards and everything because once you introduce a pose, they get so excited that they can't do that or it's something not new, it's something fun. So I'll usually have all of my stuff laid out and they can go try another pose that they haven't seen before or maybe work on one that we've done again that they really, really liked. Um, I have tons of different types of cards and games. Um, I just wanted to ask if any of you are already using yoga in your programs or your programs for kids with disabilities and if you wanted to share a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so we have been really fortunate to have a number of um, therapists in our town who are also trained in yoga, certified in yoga, um, specifically for kids with disabilities. So we've got a speech therapist who comes in um, every other month or so. And we've also started building in some of the yoga poses that the kids are used to from those classes and bringing them into our supported story times. So we've got, you know, the, um, the finger play stuff and we've got, you know, move and dance and we can bring in yoga moves to match those that they're familiar with too so that we can build on the things that they're learning and also help the parents and caregivers bring that into their homes too. So I just wanted to ask, I didn't even know it would be Shelly, but just knowing that when what Christy's sharing, she, is, you're giving to us to yeah. use and implement ourselves and to not be afraid to do so. Um, but I'm sorry, were there other questions for Christy? And I was just wondering, how many kids do you generally have? Um, so um, what I've done in the adult events is I've had Yeah, we usually, I, I go by the size of the room because parents are attending with and are either doing yoga next to or assisting their children. So like putting 20 in that room is the max and sometimes uncomfortable. Um, so at most we would have 11 kids. Yeah, at most 11. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I'm doing my private sessions in the gym or in the studio, um, I think three kids is the most I've had at once because most of the kids I work with are very, very severe. So they're needing a lot of hands-on assists, a lot of verbal cues, a lot of 
visual cues, so it's, it's um, smaller sessions. Another thing I really like to keep in mind is when I'm doing the bigger groups is um, changing the pace for the caregivers as well. So I've had families that have been coming every single year, they kind of know what I'm doing, they kind of know how to help the kids into it. Um, if they've done yoga with their kids, they're a little more experienced. But if I have a lot of new families, then I'm obviously I'm going to change that pace, maybe give more verbal cues or more um, visual cues um, to help with the, with the planning. Any other questions? Awesome. Um, if you would like, we can kind of move through a little bit of one of my stories if you would like to see kind of how they uh, flow. Y'all be interested in that. And then after that, I'll put out um, I can put out all my yoga cards and everything so y'all can look through them and see if you have any ideas, something you want for your library or any questions. If you were going, maybe what's the short, the long side would be 40 minutes, what would the yeah. short side be? The shortest would be like 10 to 15 minutes. So we might not even make it into the story. Um, with some of the kids, it may just be like picking out a couple of poses that they really, really like and then doing those. So. One of the things I like to do with the kids is I have these like really big laminated copies um, and they love these. So we might pick like two or three that they like, maybe a couple that I like, and then they help me arrange them into a flow that looks like it would connect really well. And then that might be our whole yoga session. But you know, if I've only got five poses, we might move through those five or six times. Um, they like that repetitiveness, um, which every kid, you know, it takes quite a few repetitions for them to learn. Kids with special needs, it takes even more. So even though it might be a little boring to you to do the same five, like over and over and over, and over again, they're really loving it because they're building that muscle memory and building that strength and building that confidence as well, which is really important for that internal regulation again and decreasing that anxiety. Um, yeah, just... Uh, and so, okay, we're all ready. I'm going to take off my socks because I hate doing yoga with socks, but you are all welcome to whatever you like. <laughs> I think this one I have, I think this may be what I did um, with Holly the last time um, at, um, at their library. Is everyone ready for yoga? Okay, so our friend Bear is collecting all of his friends for a special lunch. They've all been so busy running around lately that they've forgotten how to hang out with each other and have fun. So we are going to go on an adventure with Bear to collect all of our friends today. Does that sound fun? Yeah. Awesome. So we are going on a very long adventure, which means our muscles need to get ready and we need to stretch and warm up. So, it's also very cold outside, so we've got to put on all of our snow gear. So, legs out. First, our snow pants. So, wiggle your legs, get them warmed up a little bit. And then we're going to reach over to one side and pull your snow pants on. Give your legs a little squeeze. Make sure they're really in there. Those pants are fitting good. We're going to reach up, grab the other leg, and pull your pants on. Wiggle your leg if you need to. Give a couple squeezes. Make sure everything's in there. And legs together. Next, we need our big, tall socks. So pull your socks on. You can grab your feet and give them some squeezes if you need. And next goes one boot and the other boot. And we're going to make sure we're going to really good proprioceptive input, getting those muscles and everything woken up, rooting them to the ground. So I think we need some more, but let's move both of our feet together. Let's make sure that's right. There you go. Okay, now we need our big sweatshirt on. So pull those arms up. Let's go over to the one side. We've got one sleeve in. Reach over to the other side. Another sleeve. I think we're almost ready to stand up, but we need to put on our gloves as well. Let's put one glove on, another glove on, and both together. Oh, I think we need to squeeze them a little bit tighter. Let's put one on one and the other, and both. We are going 
going to slowly, slowly stand up with Mr. Bear. And let's rock side to side. Slowly warm up our legs and our hips. And I think Mr. Bear is almost ready to go on his adventure. So we're going to start moving. Walking just a little bit, hands and feet. And we're ready to go on our adventure. My little bears, can you walk around your map just a little bit? Let's see what animal we can find first. <laughs> and Mr. Bear has reached his destination. And the very first animal that he sees that he wants to play with is his friend, Mr. Penguin. Mr. Penguin is waddling around in the snow, having lots of fun. Little penguins, you can walk wherever you want on your map. You can go a little bit faster or a little bit slow. Mr. Bear and Mr. Penguin are so excited for their lunch. So they are ready to go find their next friend. My next friend I find is Moose. He is hanging out already having a snack in the meadow. So he's eating some grass. Stretch all the way up and switch. So anything I do on one side, I want to make sure I do it on the other side to keep that balance. So Mr. Moose needs some more grass. He's really hungry today. Let's grab some grass for him. Munch, 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 and stretch. Ooh, that stretch feels really good. How about we grab some more grass? And munch, 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 stretch up, and switch. He's still hungry. Let's grab some more grass. Munch, 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 and stretch up. So now we have Bear and Mr. Penguin and Mr. Moose. And next we have Mr. Giraffe. And he's also eating. They're all so hungry today. He's grabbing some leaves from the tree. Big stretch, breathe in. And breathe out. We have Mr. Penguin, Moose, Giraffe, and they're ready to go see another friend. This is Butterfly. Just flying around the same meadow as Moose and Giraffe. My little butterflies, do you like to fly slow? or super fast. And now she is ready to fly with all of her friends to go find another friend for their special lunch. We're going to reach our hands over on our knees. The next animal they found is a meerkat. Does anyone know what a meerkat is? <laughs> So Meerkat is ready to go to lunch as well, but she needs to stretch. She's going to stretch one arm and one leg forward, and let's stretch the other side, one arm forward, one leg back. Very good. Let's stretch again. One arm and one leg, and one arm and one leg, and she is ready to join the parade to go to lunch. You can go forward and backwards. Sometimes our animals like to move backwards when they're in their parade. And we see another animal. We see Mr. Frog hanging out on his lily pad. What do frogs like to do? They like to hop. Oh, can we all hop? Very nice. Can all my frogs come back to their lily pad 
walking. So we're going to straighten our legs and hang out upside down. Again, you're going to breathe in, straighten your legs, breathe out, bend your knees, breathe in, straighten your legs, breathe out, bend your knees. I think we can do one more and then Mr. Frog will be ready to go find our next friend. Breathe in, straighten your legs, breathe out. Bend your knees. Okay. Mr. Frog is hanging out on his lily pad on his pond, and he knows lots of friends that are in the pond with him. We are going to dive down into the water, and we see a school of fish swimming around. So this pose would be another one that's good for that deep proprio and balancey. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, these kids really like to be on their belly for that grounding effect as well. Oh, this is what she's going to take a break. And let's stretch just a little bit. And back down. Stretch up. And back down. And she would like to swim us to our next friend. So let's swim a little bit, Mrs. Fish. And you can kick your feet too, if you want. You can go very slow, or we can go super fast. Okay, we're almost to our next friend. We see a very, very big snake. We come all the way up. And vestibular input, adding just a little extra movement side to side. Stretch up and all the way forward. You balance your legs together for me. <coughs> together and they're all ready for their special lunch and we are so tired from our journey then we're going to lay down and take a little nap before lunch. You can wiggle your legs and wiggle your arms and then give a big stretch and relax. Sit up on your mat or 
a story, I may use the same poses two or three different times and just call it a different thing. The kids don't care because if they get to do it again, they get super excited. Um, I've had kids who will ask me if we can go back and see another animal again because they want to do that one again. So I also will take requests where I'm doing the story like, oh, you really liked Mrs. Penguin? Okay, let's go back and grab another one of her friends who's another penguin and let's, you know, do that again. So, um, constantly being flexible with the kids. If they're really loving a pose, that means they're probably needing that input or they're needing to stretch those muscles. So I will absolutely adapt to them. Um, Sometimes I'll have lots of movement puzzles planned out and I can just read the energy and tell like, oh, we don't need to move that much. We don't need to do frog hops or bear walks or anything like that. So I would do more maybe the gentle like side to side movements or going forward and backward rather than like having them hop off of their mats because kids will get, you know, will get crazy and go all over the place. But usually if you give them like a countdown or, oh, we're ready to go find our next animal and give them a few seconds, they'll all kind of collect themselves and that might be where I would do a static pose to kind of slow down and recollect. I might have to add in another animal that I wasn't planning for something that was static and then move on to the next one. But hopefully that gives you a, a good idea of kind of what it's like. Um, any other questions? <laughs> Chrissy, what are some of the other story themes you've used? Um, I mean, they usually have animals, usually but what are like animals, your beginnings and endings? Um, Nature, I might do like different types of flowers or different types of trees. Um, usually just nature or animals or um, if the kids have, well, on my private sessions, if they have like a certain activity that they're getting nervous about, then maybe I'll try to like pretend like we're going through that activity and like the steps would be different yoga poses and we might just do a yoga pose and talk about what the the things leading up to that activity, like going to the dentist or going to a new place or whatever. So just giving that calming input while talking about whatever is causing the anxiety can be another way to, to build the story. So the story doesn't always have to be like super imaginative or whatever. You can just use the poses to talk them through a life event or something they're anxious about or, you know, could be getting ready for school in the morning. You're practicing getting dressed. You're practicing putting your backpack on. Um, a lot of the standing poses can be good for that and then working towards Shavasana to kind of like relax before you go out the door to go to school. So I have my basic like 10 to 15 poses that I really like. I mix those in. Those are usually like a pretty good basis for the kids and then just build whatever activity or story I need about it. I know the snow go one that I did, the snowy yoga was a really big hit two years ago and then the first year I think we did a jungle safari. We went through the jungle. Um, I've had kids like visiting the zoo and sometimes I won't plan the animals. I'll just have them like if we're going to the zoo what do we see? They give me an animal and then I pick a pose really fast that goes along with that or have them pick like what do you think a giraffe would look like or what do you think this would look like and let them kind of help me plan the, the yoga pose as well. I remember a couple of um you added some transportation poses. I yes. guess I would say we were skiing one day yes. and so taking like, a boat ride another. Yes, yeah. so like we might do, like if you want to stand up and do this with me. So like skiing, I remember, is like you get that big, deep, prep row in, but you put one ski on, put the other ski on, and then we're skiing side to side, and then I like to do like hops. They can go back and forth, and then boat pose is already a pose, but you can go from like you did something seated, you could go in your boat and then you're rowing this way, you're rowing this way, maybe your boat looks like this, maybe your boat looks like this, maybe it's a really big boat and it looks like this. So I also like to get the kids options of they're like, oh, I can't do that, they're not just going to shut down and not participate. Oh, she told me I could do this or I could do this with my feet. So that really helps as well. So if they don't get so stuck on the motor planning, this is one right way to do this, or this is the only way that you can do this pose. Building in those um, compensations is really helpful for them and also helps with the anxiety. Um, but the transportation is sometimes a good way to transition as well. Like, we did this animal, now we have to go to a far away island to see our next animal. So we're going to hop in our boat and row over there. Um, and you can do like changing clothes for like if you're going to, I've done like we're going to different climates so our transition might be, oh we don't need our snow clothes anymore, 
we need shorts and a tank top, so let's change our clothes really quick, or we need a rain hat or an umbrella. Um, and that in turn teaches them about the seasons and different ways to dress and being aware of the temperature and everything else, which is, you know, another layer of the sensory um, processing. Chrissy, could you, you mentioned proprioceptive and vestibular senses uh, briefly. Could you give us a quick lesson in the difference and then how yes. those correspond with like those grounding or those flowing yes. movements you've done? So vestibular um, movement is, um, or vestibular is basically the movement. So all of your, how your inner ear is registering how you're moving through your space. So some of us get really dizzy really quickly. Some of us don't get dizzy at all. So that's another thing where you can be registering either too intense or not enough. So with the moving with the poses, getting upside down, that's working on that vestibular processing. Um, the proprioceptive is basically how a touch feels on your skin. So not like the actual tactile of it, like if it's scratchy or itchy or whatever, but like how deep you can feel it. Um, so that deep proprioceptive input is really grounding because it goes all the way through your nerves and your muscles and gets to those really deep receptors. So when I'm doing like the stomping or the pushing or holding like an upside down pose for an extended period of time, that um, registers on a deeper level and helps calm the neurological system. Um, that's why you see a lot of kids on the spectrum who need like weighted blankets, or they need the squeezing, it's helping them with that body awareness and that regulation as well. Sometimes they can't tell where they are in space, or they can't control their body, so giving that deep program input helps ground them and bring them back into their body so that they can motor plan through actions. Does that make, make sense? Okay. <laughs> um, Any other questions for Christy? most of the basics. Um, I'll pepper you with a couple more. Do you oh, ever use go. music in your program? I do occasionally um, with some of my private sessions. Um, if I've had a kid who's really dysregulated and they really like music, then I might use it just for a little bit to, to um, help them focus. Most of my kids get distracted by it or they're too auditorially defensive, so it, it doesn't help. Um, but I do like a lot of the kids' yoga music, and I know a lot of my kids that do it at school, they really, really like the music. Um, sometimes like at the beginning or at the end, but going through the um, session, I don't usually use music, music just because it's another distraction. They have a really hard time of listening to my voice, visually processing what I'm doing, and then also either listening to the music or tuning it out. Um, but that's just my personal preference with the kids that I've, I've worked with. So it's another thing that could be different depending on your clientele. It's a good question though. Yes? So if you were doing uh, this for a library, what would you say would be your ideal age range? Um, I take all age ranges. My youngest that I've worked with is two. My oldest that I'm working with right now is 17 or 18. Um, I don't really discriminate on the ages, so if like, a three-year-old wants to show up and a 16-year-old shows up for a group library session, that is completely A-OK. -okay. I may um, find like a middle ground with my voice or the story or how playful I make it or um, let their caregiver know, you know if they want to hold this pose a little bit longer. If they're older, that's completely OK. Or if they need to do something else or they want to skip out on something, that's completely OK. Um, but from what I've found so far is the age doesn't really matter. Um, they all do really well with, um, with it. I would just throw out that I find, um, because parents bring multiple children to library programs, it yes. is good to have a couple program assistants or yourself there um, to be the, to assist the, the child. Yeah, and usually um, the physical therapist that I work the most with will come and she kind of helps with like the hands on while I'm doing the storytelling and doing it so she can help if the kid needs help getting into a pose or the caregiver needs a little assist. And then between that and then the kids just watching what I'm doing, that seems to be a good fit. So depending on how big your group is, you might want to have like two or three assistants kind of helping. Or, um, and sometimes I'll leave out like the pictures that are um, in my story. So if those kids are going to need a visual, you know, then they would have this to look at. But um, 
for the most part, what I've found is kids do better, which is watching an actual, another peer or human or, you know, teacher or whatever, doing the poses. It's easier for them to see, oh, she's actually moving her arm this way. I can see her getting into the pose. I can see what she's doing, whereas this might be a little visually complicated because I can see what it is, but how did he get his feet apart like that? How did he motor plan that? How did he get one arm up here and one arm down here? So, and I might change the um, verbal cues while I'm working through it. So if I notice the kids are following me pretty well, then I might not cue to put your arm up or to do this arm. I never do left or right. They can do whichever side they want. If they do the opposite of me, that's fine. They know when I say switch, we do the other side of the body. But when you add in that left or right, it goes to a different part of the brain. So then they're focusing on, and that anxiety comes back. Which one's my left? Which one's my right? Oh, wait, she's opposite for me. What do I do? So the verbal cues are probably what I change the most when I'm working through sessions. Do you have any tactics that you use like, to redirect the children if they get frustrated and feel like they just want to do the whole process? Usually tying back into the breathing helps the most because when you're getting frustrated, you're getting dysregulated, you're not breathing, that anxiety is kicking in. So if I can get them to take a second, close their eyes, open their eyes, whatever, get them to breathe with me, then they're ready to try it again because they really love it and they really want to do it. So if I can just get them tied back into their breath, that's usually the best tactic. And then after that, if I can see they're regulated, then I can ask them, do you want a picture? Do you want me to show it to you again? Do you want to do it together? Do you want help? So kind of giving them those cues once they're regulated will help them work through it and figure out what they need for assistance. Because that's another part of the big, the big deal with self-regulation is helping them understand how they need help and how to ask it. I'm picturing one of our kids uh, during the, I'm sorry, what are the closing relaxation poses? Shavasana, yeah. And so the eight-year-old boy was actually lying on his mom's back, and it was just this perfect picture. And he's a, he's a busybody. And it was just this perfect picture of matching, like, his, his breathing rhythm to hers. Yes. Uh, it, it was beautiful, just that he had the opportunity to be in that pose yeah. with his mom. And the partner poses are really awesome for that. I have some of those. Um, in here, but they help the breathing because they can feel your breathing. They can really, um, they see what that feels like when you're regulated. So, let's see here. No, oh, it's not in here. So, like a double boat or like a seesaw. This one would be a lot of visual contact, and you're getting that vestibular input as well, but a little bit of proprioceptive as well because your feet and your hands are touching. So, it's all about that sensory. Um, rich dynamic if you can tie in as many types of sensory as possible without them getting dysregulated that's going to help with the body awareness and the regulation um, and the anxiety and they love 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 the partner poses so I'll do these a lot um, with kids when I have private sessions um, at the end or at the beginning it can be a warm up or a, a cool down either way when the, the other do you all want to take some time to look at these cards and do some partner poses or Try some on your own. I can lay all these out and I can just kind of dig through them and mm -hmm. see um, if there's anything you might want for your library or for your kids. Or for there's your one home. set that's the alphabet, and the kids like to do spell out their name oh, uh, by cool. doing a pose I mean, for each letter yes, of their name. And I do that in a lot of my other sessions. I'll just work on like spelling and reading and everything as well. They can pick what they want to spell. And sometimes we'll focus on emotions or what did you do at school today and that. Um, work on that two-way communication as well so it's not working on just I want I need which a lot of kids um, on the spectrum get it's like how did you feel what are we doing what are you thinking about so they can spell it out and then tie that muscle movement with it just another layer of the, of the sensory so Chrissy you are an OT yes. right yes um, but you do the gymnastics oh. therapies in the gym as yes. well yes. are there any I mean, given we don't have a gym and a foam pit in our libraries, yes. but I'm thinking balance beam or in small inclines. Are there other movements that you use that you can see us bringing into our story time, sensory story times, movement programs? Yes. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the ones that I use for transition are also things that we do in the gym that really help and what I recommend for kids at school as well. So like 
the bear walking where we're in down dog and we walk around, um, you can do tabletop pose and then that turns into a crab and then our crab can walk around. Um, frog hops, um, long rolling, um, so we are stretched out long and rolling back and forth, that's vestibular and proprioceptive together. They could even um, roll up in their yoga mat and they can roll around with their yoga mat if they want. Um, and then you have the motor plane, you have them to put your yoga mat back where it was. Um, any kind of just like hopping or jumping, um, as long as you're like, okay, we're gonna do five and then we freeze. Or we're gonna do three and then we freeze. So just um, keeping in mind the static and the dynamic. If you're gonna do the bear walks all around, then make sure you freeze at the end of the posture before you move into um, something else. Balance beam is really awesome for the kids um, for that visual scanning and body awareness as well. Um, I try to mix in um, as much side to side, forward and backwards, so you get them moving in all of the planes. Um, so that's a good thing to keep in mind when you're doing um, sensory motor. I use these for stations a lot of the time. So like they could go to one station and they get to spell their name. They get to go to this station and you pick a partner pose with your caregiver or whoever's with you. Um, these you could pick and try and build like a little flow. I have a couple of um, memory games. So I might like put out some and they could try and match the yoga poses. So it's got like all the basic ones. Um, so it's another good like visual visual cue, but another fun element to it. Or I'll, and I always take away the pressure. Like if you don't want to play the game and do the matching, just pick out your favorite poses and do it. If you don't want to spell, pick out your favorite letters and do those. Or pick out your favorite poses and then you know talk about that letter or whatever. So I never make it like this is what you're doing and this is set. Give them as many options as possible so they don't feel like they're failing. As long as they're trying something, then that's amazing and we're building that self-confidence. And I would also say when I think yoga, I always see, think quiet and calm and that is not what our programs look like and that's <laughs> <No>. okay. <laughs> And you're comfortable with that, and we should be comfortable oh, yeah. with that, too. Yeah, yeah. I adjust my voice how it needs to be. I adjust the pace. It's constantly checking in with the kids and seeing how it is, but it is not quiet and not calm. And sometimes I have to do my own yoga afterwards to kind of, like, <laughs> de-stress from it. But as long as they look like they're having fun and they're focused on you, then whatever happens, happens. And they might do two poses with you, and that's it. That's fine or they might do the entire flow. And I've had kids like, we'll take a break for three or four poses, and then, but they're still watching and listening, and then when they're ready to re-engage, I always let them, you know, pop back in or whatever. Um, a lot of cueing with when you're ready or if you want to do this. Um, but it gets a little crazy sometimes, but it's fine with kids. <laughs> Other questions? You know, I have some um, cards as well that I can hand out to anybody who likes them. But I guess I'll spread all of these out and then you can come look at them if you'd like. Type of jump, or maybe we're just, you know, practicing some different animal jumps at the end of it. Or the seals on the bus, we can be acting out some of those things. And that would feel less pressure for me to remember everything that I need to remember, and also be a really natural way to start building it in in more um, intensive ways. Awesome. I think that um, for a sensory story time that I'm starting up, we use carpet tiles to define the kids' space. So even having something like a defined space without having their own yoga mat could incorporate similar things that Shelly just said, like a little movement on their square, something, because yeah. that's a lot. I love what you did, but that's like way too hard to even think of doing on my own. Oh, like yeah. Little elements. Yeah. I think it's good to like, they have their little space, they get to do like a little movement and then instead of like making them more kind of crazy, it, it grounds them. So like they do a little movement and they can sit down and you'll see that they're already listening better. They're already more engaged because they got that movement out and they got to get the wiggles out and then they're ready, ready to go. So. 
I'm thinking of like Froggy Gets Dressed, that book, and you know, where he takes everything off and puts it on again and goes outside and re repeats his getting yeah. dressed and undressed. Oh, the, um, yes. the making the connection of your foot against yes. the floor. And you have like Carol Peterson Stevens singing the rain song, the rain is coming down, splash on the floor, yeah. and trying to think of how can I use more of those um, proprioceptive yes. connections, heavy movements. Maybe you've done this is have the kids create the story, so like randomly they pick something and then oh, yeah. just create it together. Oh, and... absolutely. I think that's wonderful. So you have to remember? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make it easy on yourself, yes. <laughs> and it can be random, right? Yes. No, awesome. Anyway, I think the Walking in the Jungle book mm -hmm. would go so well with this. There's something that I, my daughter and I listen to, um, I think it's called Be Calm on Awe Island. It's a podcast uh -huh. to like, help you get to bed, and they always tell me to do dragon breaths. Uh -huh. So she and I do dragon breaths before bedtime, and there was one day in um, story time where I just, I had a huge group, it was summer, everybody was really worked up, and so finally I was just like, have you guys ever heard of dragon breaths? <laughs> yes. And so I was actually just thinking about it the other day, I'm like, I should do dragon breaths again, because it just helps everyone yeah. kind of come back to what we're doing, especially if you just did something that's very high energy and you need to move live and sit for an extended period of time or something yeah. else. And using, if you're doing the animals or anything else as well, but um, if you just naturally incorporate a sound, like if I'm in a pose and we're being a cow, what does a cow say? Let's move, that's breathing out, and then you naturally have to breathe in for the next thing. So you can incorporate those sounds as well with the proprioceptive and everything as well, so that they're not really having to consciously focus on their breath. Like, I don't know if I know how to breathe in or breathe out, but the natural sounds or talking or whatever helps with that as well as it's another layer you can easily put into it it takes the stress off of you to remember did i tell them to breathe did i not well this animal is making this sound like a hissing with the snake chrissy some people were sitting down and you were telling us up in front about the um were they ninja cards what are oh, yes. the so the, Will you share those and maybe a sound, a pose and a sound from yeah, there? Yeah, so the yoga warrior cards and my older boys, you know, they're like, oh, yoga's for girls, yoga's for babies, yoga's for little kids. So this really like ties them back into like, oh, it's for everyone. It's just stretching and, and having fun. Um, so there's like, there's weather ones like blizzard weather and things like that, but there's also like, this one, so it's tree pose, but he's like an awesome transformer warriors, warrior. So you can have him like, what kind of sound do you think that he would make? Or what do you think that he would do when he's getting into this pose? So they might be like grunting or screaming or whatever, but that also lets out some of that pent up anxiety as well. And it kind of goes with the motor movement and it might help them get into the pose. So you can encourage them to make whatever sound they want. Um, this one, so it's triangle, but on this one he is solar blaze. So this one, every time I do triangle pose, I usually have the kids, we switch from side to side. So we might make like a whooshing sound. So we sit here, whoosh, whoosh. So you naturally have to breathe in and out as you're going sideways. So you're getting proprioceptive from standing. You're getting the vestibular input from going side to side. You're working on your breathing, and you're also getting the auditory input from you doing it, but also listening to me while I'm breathing and doing it. So you wouldn't think that there's so many little things that are happening in one tiny little thing, and they don't realize it either, which makes it 